This is the official EFL podcast with Mark Clement. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the official EFL podcast with me, Mark Clement, your weekly dash around all things Skybet Championship, League One and League Two. Just a month and a half of the regular season to go, which means that for many clubs, they're already heading into their final 10 games of the season. Just one of the things we're going to be reflecting on on this week's episode of the official EFL podcast. I'm delighted to say that at the age of only 42, he's already been a manager for 13 seasons and approaching 700 games. Joining us throughout this week's episode of the official EFL podcast is the recently departed Oxford United manager, Carl Robinson. Can I ask you, in any way, when you leave a club and you've been struggling during the last couple of months. Yeah. Is it in any way a relief, Carl? Um, I think we're, 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 we just, we always say, oh, we're fine, we're fine. And yeah, it's a relief. And we're, I don't think any of the emotions that managers actually say are, are actually true sometimes. I think that you don't know how you feel because you've got friends there. You've got people who might have stitched you up at times. Not, and that wasn't the case at my last club, but I'm talking at other other clubs. Just people, there's players that might have over overperformed, underperformed. Um, things that you've done that you would have changed, things that you wouldn't have changed. So all of the things when you look at as a football manager, when you look back at the the experience that you have, the emotions right away are so unpredictable, and and, and they flip from oh, oh, I'm out, I'm out of it. Three o'clock on a Saturday, why aren't he in it? I wish I was given a chance to prove my worth. Um, and all of these things sort of go through your mind on a consistent basis. And it, it doesn't half play with your head. It really does. Um, I think that I'm not getting away, mate, if you listen to anything I've said. I've got no gripes at all with what's going on at Oxford United. I think the results in the last two months are just of nowhere near being good enough. Um, the external pressure on, on certain situations in my life as well. Um, there's been so many things that have been chucked that I've had to deal with. And I've tried to stay true to who I am as a person. I think the, there's always an element of relief, but a, a tinge of regret um, and frustration as well. That I know 100% that Oxford will not go down. I, I, I knew that because I, I have faith, even though the results weren't great. I've been through situations and I know what it takes to get to the summer to then build and, and to go from there. And this year for Oxford United was one of the biggest transition years they would have gone through with ownership change, chairmanship change, CEO coming in, and it was all positive moving forward, and it will be positive moving forward as well. Um, it's just the fact that the results on the football pitch was, were nowhere near good enough. I mean, can you share with us what it is like to be in that kind of tornado where, this might sound like brutal language, but it's slipping away from you. It's slipping away in so much as, at some point, the, the club hierarchy take the responsibility away from you, where you yeah. just cannot turn that cycle around. You know, it was three league wins in your final 16, one point from your last, was it eight games? Yeah, it was horrendous. It was the last win. Was, yeah. I, I was, I was at, so, yeah. I was at Cheltenham yesterday and someone who said to me, so it was from a, a radio station, said, oh, I was at that, the Ipswich game, what a great game that was. I said, that was my last win. Um, and it, it, he sort of went, wow, that was a long time ago. And I think, you can feel it, Clem. There's been a number of times in my career as a manager and as an assistant that have felt it. I remember Paul Ince, we played Wigan away. Um, I got beat 3-0. Valencia scored two. And I just fit. It's just a weird feeling that you, I don't think people truly understand. Um, I felt that as a coach and then as a manager. Um, I remember getting beat 3-0 at home. Um, 3-0 seems to even be my result to leave to South End. And then obviously I, I just knew and the chairman came in at, at the end of the game. He just looked at me and said, can we have a conversation tomorrow? I felt like saying, I effing know what you want. Just tell me now. Um, and I said, yeah, not a problem, chairman. I'll come and see you at your house tomorrow. And then even um, with the Oxford United one, obviously got beat 3-0. And it was, we were good for the first 20 minutes. And I felt in complete control. And we give a penalty away. And you're just thinking, I don't deserve this. And you just seen the energy, just seep out of myself and the players and, and then you get the phone call at nine o'clock in the morning um, just to say you've been relieved of your duties. And you just think to yourself, you, that, that first bit, mate, is more embarrassment. 
and, and regret and a little bit of sadness and well complete sadness and you have to have time to reflect and the first 48 hours are so surreal you don't feel like you've been sacked like I, I literally got in my car and I asked for it to be delayed for two hours while I got I went and got all my stuff out the office I requested the opportunity to go in the next day to speak to all of the players um, I didn't want the players to see me walking out with all boxes and stuff on the on the Monday. So I cleaned me my office on the Monday, on the Sunday, and went and seen everybody on the Monday. And I was just not until two days down the line that you think, I'm actually gonna drive here again, or this has been my home for five years. Every single day of your life, there's been a phone call from somebody in this building and it's just gone. It, it, it's it's this is easier than the MK one, mate, because that was Jasmine's life. And she spent her whole younger years coming to work with me. And I had to tell her. Just for the, anybody that doesn't know, this is your daughter. Yeah, so. and you know what, what she means to me. And where this one, it was more like she's 16, 17. And she didn't really come to me. She never came to work with me anymore. So this is more about me dealing with this for me, which I felt a little bit easier with. Uh, and I knew I needed another challenge as well. Weirdly, the two summers I've turned down certain jobs. I've not kept my job the following year at the club. And I always think if I would have left at that particular time, would fans have not liked me for it and called you a, a, a cheat, a, a traitor? Or And they're, they're questions as a manager. You always ask yourself, like, when these come, if you leave, fundamentally you, you've jumped ship. When you don't leave, you know there's going to be a time when you're going to go through two months where you're not going to win a game of football. It doesn't matter who that is at the, at the top, top level. And then they want you sacked anyway. So it, it, you can never keep everybody happy when you stay or when you leave as a manager. Is there a is there a funny sort of almost em, embarrassment about it because it's a very public having the rug pulled from un, under you? I mean, it, it, people in everyday life, if they did a bad job and got sacked from their job, well, yeah, they'd be there in a circle, but it wouldn't be splattered all over the sort of media, etc., mm. etc. Cetera, et cetera. Do, do you a little bit? Hide away as you're filling your car up with fuel or popping into Aldi to get some Bavarian ham or whatever it is you do with your life. I am um, no, not for me, not for me. I, I'm so proud of what I've achieved there. I um, I wrote down some of the, the real bad stuff that have gone on in my life in this five year period and things that I would change and would have done different. And there were so many things personally that I would have done and professionally as well. But I, I was doing something the other day with a podcast that worked out that was at 1.1, 1.2 million every over 11 transfer windows that we sold. I, I, there's not many that can boast that with two playoff campaigns, a record points tally in the year that we finished seventh or eighth quarterfinals in the Carabao Cup, seven, eight Premier League games with six of them coming to the Kassam. Um, young players now in Gatlin Adonka, Tyler Goodrum, James Golden, doing well, Jay, uh, Josh Johnson. All these young players that you've worked with now coming to the forefront of their age band where they're actually going to have an impact on the first team. Leading goal scorers in the EFL for, for two consecutive years or seasons. I don't think, as well as selling all them players, to still keep achieving that for four years is, is quite remarkable on the players and the staff. We just had a horrendous transfer window, two really bad transfer windows. And that fundamentally leaves you in that difficult situation where you're fighting against the tide a little bit. I'm so happy for Liam Manning as well, by the way. And I know people who don't know him, he's a good man. Clem, you would have done some work with him. It's certainly, yeah, but you, yeah. He's one of the real good guys. And I know the staff will be safe working with a good person. And I know he's the right person as well. It's almost like we are very similar in our in, in how we do things. Maybe I'm a little bit more, I want more emotion. You have a little bit less emotion. You might be a little bit better with maybe the new things that go on, I might be a lot worse than him. And we have, obviously we have our strengths and weaknesses, but as a human being and as a coach, I think it's the perfect, perfect blend for them. And I have no, no resentment whatsoever for him taking that job or them moving forward together. it would be something I'd be really proud of. I mean, this is incredibly selfless stuff that you're sharing with us. And that was on my list, actually, because, you know, that, that moment when somebody else is appointed to take over a project, to use that awful word football fans don't like, but it feels apt. Uh, you know, that it's been your lifeblood for five years and somebody else, but it must be a bit like, well, I won't say sleeping with your wife, but it's along those lines, isn't it? Not good at the moment, no. Um, it's... <laughs> 
Um, I think, I think, Keep going, my boy. I, Keep I, going. The thing for me is when, when Liam came out and got the job, I knew he was getting the job a few hours before, um, and I texted him right away just to say, listen, I know obviously the inevitable is going to happen and I really want to wish you all luck in the world. And I just wanted him to know that there's incredible people in there and some wonderful footballers that are just having a bit of a difficult time. I think sometimes when you're in it, because the players, we all care for each other, the players and me, um, and then on top of that, you look at, um, I texted the chairman and I actually said to him, I think it's a real, real, the right one for everybody. It's not, not that it's not anything to do with me, Clem, it's, it's, it certainly isn't. And whether I agree with it or disagree with it, they couldn't really give two hoots, but I thought it was the right thing to do that really deep down. I'm not a bad person, mate. I'm not somebody that really wishes someone to fail. Uh, I, it's not who I who I am or who who I want to be. I make mistakes as we all do, but fundamentally, that this is his life. He's got a young child as well, and Oxford have got fans who you want to build that. I see what happened to MK Dons when I left. He tried to change the philosophy and everything that went on, and he's lost a generation of fans. And now every manager since that is actually trying to rebuild it. Oxford United in the last four years has created more shirt sales. There's more yellow walking around the city. And Liam is the right man to carry on the next generation of fans that can drive their football club to where they, they think it should be. Why should I have any remorse about that? Why? It's not to do with me. I'm, I'm proud of what I've achieved. And I think we have put Oxford back on the map. They were a conference team not too long ago, Clem. And now they're not. Now they're competing. They're looking to compete. In the, and they find it frustrating when they're mid-table in League One because of what we've done. So good luck. I mean, this is quite... This is good to hear you talking like this because if you can have a period of self-reflection, because it, it has been 13 years, and I think mm. across the whole of that period, you've maybe had two, three weeks out the gap between MK, Dons, and going to Charlton. I think you just I think you got the Oxford job on the same day you left Charlton, didn't you? So if you can have that period of self-reflection, it also has to include, as well as the stuff that you feel you didn't get right, the promotion with MK Dons, the two playoffs with Oxford United, doesn't it? Because that lets you know that the way you do things is along the right line. Yeah, I think if you look, I, I'm a developer of players. That's what I enjoy doing. Um, I've never had that budget in the top six that everyone can rave over. And I've never had one of them opportunities where we've certainly had, I've, I've never spent millions of pounds, never done that. <clears throat> I've never, I don't know the record, my record transfer is about three, 250, 300,000 maybe in them 13 years. And I would have sold near 40 million pounds worth of players, the 35 million pounds worth of players in that time. I've never had a top six budget. I've flirted with it, seven, six, seven, eight maybe, but never won them at the top. And, and that's what I get hired to do. And that's what I'm always proud of achieving. And I think to, to, in them 13 years, I think four or five playoff campaigns, big cut wins, promotions, a relegation, from the, the, obviously from the championship which is one of the best experiences because when you go in there on the lowest budgets other than Yeovil, I think if you take Yeovil out of it, MK is one of the lowest budgets they've had in the in the championship. So I'm so, so proud of what, what I have done and I know my family's incredibly proud as well. It doesn't mean that you're boasting or you're, you're arrogant or you're big-headed. I think you should be allowed to actually look at what you've done and have that little smile that you know people have got a career because some of the things that you've done and you put a smile on some people's faces. Equally on, on the reverse of that, I've, just, I've made mistakes as well, but that's football, that's life in general, that's that's never going to change. And it doesn't matter what calibre human being you are or professional you are, that's part of what we do. Making mistakes is... i got this big gripe at the moment, Clem. I was with Sam the other day, Sam Allardyce, and we were, we were frustrated because I think English fans get English managers wrong. And the EFL, right, is the best group of leagues in the world that's not commercialised. The Premier League, as we well know now, is the most commercialised, the most watched, the most entertaining league you're ever likely is going to see. But our, our leagues that sit underneath this, come on, let's have a little look at how good we actually are. People are raving at the moment, that obviously the Brighton manager who's doing one of the best jobs in the Premier League. I think he had four or five sackings mm. at the beginning of his career. I was looking yeah. just the other day at Rafa Benitez, win percentage of 25-30% um, in the Secunda at the bottom of La Liga before he got the Valencia job. And I think sometimes yeah. that went on the content, and I've got a lot of people who coach and work over there, they actually speak about when people lose their jobs. They see it as a tremendous positive because you've actually been in the indulgence and you've actually actually 
dig a little bit deeper to find who you are. But I just... Yeah, yeah, but Carl, Carl, wait a second. The the other side of that is because sometimes manager go managers go, I'm going to learn from this experience. But in the current modern day culture, football fans don't care. They only care about their club in that season, don't they? They're not bothered about it being a, a career stepping stone no, but it's, it's, for you yeah. to be better in the future. But but surely, Clem. The best version of you is off the back of you being a good person, making the mistakes that you make, and that's that's the same as a player. At the top level of our game, we speak about people who fall short, who come back stronger. Now, this is not a this is not me. This is me back in English managers, British managers, because I know how good I were. I go against them every single week, and I've I've seen a switch in the last four or five years, Clem, of of real tactical brightness that you've gone, whoa. And it's really made me stand up on the touchline and gone, you've got to be a bit different now. You've got to change this. You've got to be quicker. You've got to... And this is... this is It's so exciting to see. And you look like Scott Brown. What he's achieving at Fleetwood. Mm. It, it, what could Fleetwood at mid-table? Does that, does that get unnoticed? Possibly. And, and I just feel that... There's and what Liam Manning did at MK, and I know we had a bad year at the beginning of this season, but what he's done in his first few years, there's so many good managers, and I don't think they get the reward for actually if you're a good person and you fall short, that I think and you take responsibility, you you do become better because of the consequences of that. I said to you now, Clem, you said before 13, 14 years and there's 700 games. I probably wouldn't have said this to after 200 games, maybe or 100 games. But I think I've done it long enough to understand that I've seen managers get sacked and the game that you've managed against me, I've had the sack, I've been hired, I've lost players, I've sold, I've done all of the things that I've been promoted, I've been relegated. I've had, I've seen so many different facets of the football game as a manager that I actually know them moments and actually stand you in good stead as well. Fascinating. You have agreed to share with us your thoughts on a, a few of the sort of key teams and things that are happening across the EFL. I'm going to go in the Skybet Championship. Burnley, two defeats, 19 points clear of Middlesbrough in third, which means they need three wins from their final nine matches to return to the Premier League. They are actually still on course to beat the three points for a win record over a season, which is held by the record points tally is held by Reading from 2005-06. What do we put that astonishing season down to, Carl? I think it's, it's a mix really, isn't it? I think the first thing is clarity at the beginning in change of style and, and formula. Uh, recruitment, the biggest, biggest, one of our biggest fundamental um, requirements to be successful is recruiting the right players to play a certain way. The jigsaw, the the manager created, it almost looks like he got the perfect pieces. And that, and it didn't start great, did they? If you remember, I don't think ever at the beginning, and I know they, they played an awful lot. And I think oh, after three or four games, you started to see the evidence of what he'd worked on in the summer. And I think the, the pieces just sort of fell, but they were pieces that they recruited right, coach right. And then once you get on that rhythm of winning games of football, there's no better feeling, mate, in the world than that. Obviously, you go into a game of football and you know you're just pressing on, and the players' fluidity, confidence, the look always falls on your side as well. They're an absolute joy to watch. They really are. I think I watched it was a Sheffield United. They believe they play. I watched them on Sky the other week. It's got twine, scored a free kick late on. And in that game, they were so dominant for large periods in, in, in how they moved the football and how efficient they were. That's what I like about them. They're efficient in both boxes. They they get there in a calculated way, but they're ruthless in that. But not forgetting also underneath the ball how secure they are as well. Is it is it seeing stuff that others don't as well? Because I could look at Nathan Teller, who's now scored 19 in all competitions, 17 in the league, and go, couldn't Southampton have done with him this season rather than sending him out on loan? Mate, I, I've done that, though, where you, 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 you let players go out on loan because they just don't fit who you are or what you are and they do well. <clears throat> it doesn't mean they would have stayed there, that he would have been a success or he would have achieved what he's achieved. Sometimes there's moments in your career where everything aligns itself in, in the perfect way. 
and that alignment, no one knows what alignment could be. You're talking, I was speaking today about transfers, how unpredictable they are. Even the best clubs in the world look at only, I think it's a 49% success. I don't know what the judges' success, by the way, but what they foresee is their, their success, about 49% of their transfers work. So, and that's one of the best teams in the world that actually recruiting players. So it just shows you how wrong you can get it. But equally, when you get it right, it could be an emotional thing. It could be a, just happy with his life. And playing with players around and actually suit his style as well. Yeah, it's an astonishing machine-like, and that's how I remember describing Reading back in 2005-06, run of form from Burnley. It's 14 league wins and unbeaten last 17 matches. Absolutely unbelievable. I want to talk the battle for the second automatic Ooh. promotion player. So Sheffield United have had this blip, four defeats in seven since their second 10-match unbeaten run. Middlesbrough been making up ground, although Sheffield United yes. won in midweek at Sunderland, whereas Middlesbrough dropped home points against Stoke. With nine games left and six points to make up, I mean, it's possible. Is it likely to happen that Middlesbrough could usurp them? Um, Do you want me to explain what usurp means, Carl? No, no, okay uh, no, no, no. I'm just processing who you. I wondered what. The, yeah, I wondered what the gap was there before you spoke. No, because I, you look at the way the football works, and obviously them, them, them obviously dropping a few points at home just the other day, and then obviously they come from behind. That's nice. Sheffield United didn't able to win two one, was it? Or they win two one last night? And, uh, they won at Sunderland last yeah. night. Their two Manchester City loanees were on McAteer. target for them, and it was two one. Yeah, and you, and you think to yourself, ooh, like, this championship. This is what I was saying to you before with the EFL. Like, it's brilliant. It really is. And you, for me, I think. This weekend's games, when they come around, I'm not sure who to put. It, it, something needs to fall soon for it to be a positive for, for Middlesbrough, and they have to. They, I remember chasing Port, uh, Preston. What, what more positive than what's happened over Michael Carrick's entire time, where he's taken them no, from know, what, 21st in the table no, all says, the way to? Yeah, but I'm talking to catch them. Like I'm talking, they, I think they've got to see something negative in Sheffield United, and then there's got to be a belief that. What he's done, I, I was talking to some of the LMA the other day, he's probably got, I think him and Steve Cooper are probably the best two managers what they've achieved this year. I've been, they've been the two for me, what Steve Cooper's done in the Premier League and what Michael Carrick's done at Middlesbrough. They're the two outstanding performances in my view. I know we're just speaking there about company, about what he's achieved and they're going to run away with it and he probably will win the award, I think. But where Matt Carrick took Middlesbrough from and what Coop's doing with Nottingham Forest. But I just, that gap is, a, is, it got this week. It just got a bit bigger, felt. And if if there's a, if there's a negative result for Middlesbrough at the weekend, the positive from Sheffield, it just becomes almost so big. I just think something's got to fall for Sheffield United for for Middlesbrough to catch up. It's got to happen in the next few weekends for me, because then the gap can just become too big. And the Easter period, the the EFL yeah. period, like that that is the time when you do really see what goes on over them periods. Yeah, me. Yeah, I think Sheffield United will do it me, personally. Okay. Um, well, thanks for sharing. As a Middlesbrough fan, we appreciate your input. Uh, let me tell you where we are this weekend, and actually, Middlesbrough could make up ground because I need to remind everybody that four of the eight FA Cup quarter finalists are from the EFL. So Burnley go to Man City on Saturday. Then on Sunday, Sheffield United face Blackburn Rovers. Grimsby go to Brighton. I'll just mention Man U. Fulham is the other tie. So in the Skybet Championship this coming weekend, it is Blackpool, just a second league win in 20 matches, but sensational with their thrashing of QPR in midweek. They entertain playoff chasing Coventry. Third place Middlesbrough are at home to Preston. Millwall in six, just keep on in the mix there. They're at home to Huddersfield. Stoke, three league wins in five, entertain Norwich, who are four points off 
sixth. Luton, another team who've been absolutely sensational in fourth. They go to Sunderland. Watford, six points off the playoffs, entertain Wigan. On Sunday is Swansea against Bristol City. Actually, when you look at that cluster of teams in the playoff places, even sixth to seventh, a four-point gap is, with with the games thinning um, and the consistency of Millwall, particularly at home, Carl, um, yeah, obviously it's achievable, but there's a little bit of a gap there, isn't there? <laughs> I, I honestly, this is this this league. Even for I think it was from week eight, I looked at the Championship League, and you just thought of, oh, this is this is this is setting itself up to be perfect. And you look at even like Preston. I think Preston are down eleven. Is looking here with fifty three points. Like they're only seven points off Millwall as well. And you think to yourself, how far down can you look of teams that actually can close that gap? And if it actually finishes now, the Championship. You could end up next season still competing. The teams that obviously come down from the Premier League, but the likes of Borough on the up, Watford, West Brom, Norwich, like these are huge, huge teams. And the Championship even next season is going to be even more, just as entertaining and just as big. For me, I do think personally, Norwich or West Brom might get a little bit of a run and might jump in there late. I just think the size of them teams, I know West Brom obviously had that little, obviously they had that upturn in form right at the beginning when the manager came in and plateaued a little bit to an extent, but still have the players and have the know-how maybe towards the back end of the season. And again, when you go into the back end of the season, what are the squads like? What's the depth like of the squads over the Easter period when you play two games in quick succession? And I think obviously the one thing that Millwall does have, when they play at home, you've been there as well, Clem, it's such a hard place to go. The fans are so behind their team and it's so hostile. And they do make that a real fortress. And it it'll be it'll be a difficult it is a difficult place for anybody to go and get a result. But I do look at the likes of Norwich and West Brom creeping up behind them. I do fancy one of them two getting in. Mm, I don't know. I was I was walking in the centre of London the other day. And this guy looked across and saw me and walked on. And then he turned around and said, oh, uh, thank you very much for all you do for lower league football, bringing some of these stories to the fore, all the rest of it. And he turned out to be a Millwall fan. And I'm going, you've had an amazing season. Oh, yeah, but we won't, we won't, you know, we always mess up at the last. I'm going, yeah, but look at the consistency of just missing out on the playoffs the last couple of years. Look at the manager you've got in charge. And so there's a little bit of mentality there, isn't it? Every, you know, and at some point there'll be a surprise for those surprises. Supporters and they will confound what's happened in previous seasons, and they will make the cut. Yeah, yeah, and, and and again, there's no there's no rhyme or reason why that is. Sometimes you you just have that consistency in a manager and a group of players that find the rhythm that becomes unplayable, and you find the you, when you when you've got a home ground which is as hostile and as as intense what they do, you do find yourself on a win putting your, your, your front foot forward and winning more games than what you're losing. But I just see the likes of Norwich and West Brom underneath that. And by the way, that's not to say Millwall could be the team dropping out, Clem. That's, 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 Good point. Like, we're sorry, Good point. That's, 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 like, you're getting Blackburn's only a point ahead of them in fifth. And, you, you, and again, you're not saying they're not going to be the ones, but the, the, the level of um, teams at, that, at the moment in time, anyone could beat anybody. And this is what makes that league right now one of the most fascinating leagues in the world. For, for me, I, I'm, you know, I'm just a huge football fan and I love watching games in the Championship because of how intense they are. I, I, I will just tell everybody that it's quite rare, actually, but every single team in the Skybet Championship has now played 37 games. So aside from the top two, well, actually, let's do the top two. Burnley on 83 points, Sheffield United on 70, then Middlesbrough in third on 64, Luton in fourth on 63. Blackburn in fifth are uh, on 61, Millwall in sixth on 60, and then come Norwich on 56, West Brom on 55, Coventry on 54, Watford on 54, Preston on 53. I could go down. Let's put Sunderland in there in 12th on 52 as well. Any surprises at the bottom of the table, Carl? Reading from the bottom no. up, Wigan bottom on 33. Huddersfield ahead of them on goal difference, then two points ahead of them, a Blackpool, and then there's a four-point gap to Cardiff, fourth bottom on 39. No surprises no, there? Not at all for me, no. Not one bit. I think that's, that's quite consistent. Okay. I think if you looked at the games this year, um, I know Blackpool had a fantastic result of the big QPR, 6-1 in the week. 
Um, I think three goals up. We ended really early on as well. I was, I was come, I was going back for something, listening to it in the in the car. And but you look, you look down. I think one of the biggest shocks is obviously QPR's sort of run of form, finding themselves sort of drifting mm-hmm. down there. Um, yeah. But other than that, I think the inconsistency of managers coming and going at Cardiff, not not no coincidence to me. To see them down there for that reason. Blackpool always knew this year was going to be hard, and they got sixty points last season, which was unbelievable for them after the promotion from League One. Uh, Huddersfield, I think obviously the the disappointment of last year missing out, and then obviously the manager and and so many things going wrong, and the ma- and again the manager maybe choosing a good time to leave and going, and Wigan were always going to find it difficult. The teams coming up from League One were always going to find it difficult for obvious reasons as well. But again, the change in manager, losing Liam, do they regret that now? I hope they do, in a way. Um, because obviously without him, it's not as if things have drastically changed. Uh, and obviously they brought another manager in after him and now another manager in. And you just and it's not the manager's fault they were going in, but arguably it was always going to be a difficult job for them teams to, to sort of stay up. So for me, it's not a it's not overly surprising them teams are down there. But the, but again, no Clem, look at Wigan being the Premier League, Huddersfield being the Premier League, Blackpool being the Premier League, Cardiff being the Premier League. The four teams at the bottom have been Premier League teams. <laughs> in the in the last decade, yes. it is quite astonishing. It is, it's um, it's Carl, brilliant. Carl did share with us before we started recording this week's episode of the Officially AFL podcast that he was using a laptop he hadn't used since he left Oxford United and he only had about 20% battery. Left- First question is, where's the, where's the power lead? I don't have a clue. I don't, I don't need a laptop for now. When I get a job... I'm okay, gonna- fine. More importantly, how much uh, how much battery have you got left? Because eleven percent. How fast to go through? Eleven percent. Yeah, I think we're. I think we've got this in hand. Tell us about the division that you've had most recent experience of. I mean, again, if we're talking about surprises, Chef Wed again, just a, a juggernaut. It will be half a season unbeaten if they come through this Friday night's game at home to Bolton unscathed. I mean, and their win percentages as well are just absolutely crazy. It's 11 wins in 12 for them. It's not a surprise the moment. for me. Um, I was... Manager or, or club size? What, what, they, what they did in the summer. I was, I was after half their players and you just couldn't get anywhere near them. Um, okay, but I think it's not. But when people think that's just easy, just to get players and just to put them on a pitch. I think the manager's calmness and the way Moro is, he's just you know, right? He's just a top top fella. The size of the club needs somebody who's who's quite calm in his approach, but he's he's aggressive in, in when he needs to get something. You know, on a touchline, you, you feel that. And the players have just been magnificent. We we um, we Oxford drew we. We drew there, and I remember we missed a penalty. Just shows you how my luck's been in the ninety-fourth minute to win, and you there was a little bit of sort of mumblings around the place, and I thought, I'm sure they haven't lost in three or four weeks here, and that's but that's the level of anticipation that Sheffield Wednesday fans put on their team because of the level that they're at. I don't think it helps when you when you're at a managing a team and the the team closest to you in Sheffield United. And in the Premier League and competing to get back in the Premier League and you see your scene so far off. So that increases the level of expectation, or especially on the manager anyway. But it doesn't surprise me where they are. One with the manager and two with the calibre of the players. And three, how intense it is to go to Hillsborough and play. So if, if they were obvious contenders for automatic promotion, of Plymouth, Ipswich, Barnsley, Derby and Bolton, who currently occupy those other top six places in that mm. order. Who's 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 been the biggest surprise to you of Plymouth, those other five teams? Off the back of last season to, to be there for two consecutive seasons is remarkable. And what Shuey's done off the back of Lowy going to, to Preston it is is testament to him. And O'Neill Dewsnip who, who was my coach when I was nine years of age. Um there's a as I think he's football director of football there. Again, we speak about the impact on fans Clem, you've, you've been to Plymouth. When you go down there, mate, that is, I know they say Green Army, but it is. The, the It's so intense and they're so behind the team. I went there once, I said, if we can keep this, if we can keep the, not conceding the first 25 minutes, they might turn. I was so wrong. They stay behind their team and stay behind their team. And, and that gives you so much more confidence to go and make mistakes when you know the fans are going to stay behind you. 
But I do, obviously, Ipswich now have not lost in a number of games, I don't think it is. I think one of the most well, it's five consecutive wins. Having had that period when they just couldn't win a game, they were drawing and drawing and drawing. It's five consecutive wins for them now. Yeah, and I think Barnsley underneath that are finding a little bit of level of consistency. And again, they, they play yeah. the, the systems. They play. I'm not going to say what they do, but they play a system is quite hard to play against, and they have this rotation. Well, you can say what they do now no, because no, no, you've got no. Best Duff is a top man as well. I, I, He's a, the manager's come through and done well at Cheltenham, doing well there. And they, obviously, they play the, how high their age play and how disconnected their wing backs play, and the strikers don't actually connect. It's 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 so brilliant to watch and to work to, to play against. And you'd actually, actually you respect it immensely because you know you can see what they're doing, but you, you've, it's so hard to try and stop. And they seem to be the team that seems to find that little bit of consistency. I know Derby haven't lost many games since Warney's gone in there. Bolton are having a little bit of a blip, but again, I still think they're going to be all right. If it was a better man, mate, I'd probably say the top six for me will probably be the top six. Who goes in second? Let's just leave that. I don't want to offend, I don't want to offend anyone, angry, so yeah. I'm leaving that one. No. Well, that's unusual for you, mate. Um, at the bottom of the table... Um, Forest Green bottom, Cambridge above them, then Morecambe, then MK, and then Accrington in the first position of safety, just below Oxford. A, a lot of those names I've just said, are they? Uh, are there a lot of teams there that have just hit the wall? They've been overperforming, climbing up the pyramid in recent seasons. Uh, we've got used to, uh, I don't know, an Accrington Stanley being in the yeah. third tier, but actually they've just they have been punching above their weight for several. Yeah. Years now, John Coleman won't thank me for that because he says, "No, don't call us little Accrington Stanley." But those those teams I've named, y- you do just hit the wall at some point. And by the way, they've got loving new dressing rooms there as well. It's, like, it's actually well, Accrington's yeah. a nice place to go and play. No, 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 don't say that in that con. What I mean by that is they've got new dressing rooms now. The pitch is fantastic. The 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 facilities, the hospitality facilities are some of the best you're going to go to now. So they've, they've really worked hard. For as much as Accrington, people might see they've been here in the league and dropped a little bit down. I think that what, what's actually happened off the football pitch has been far greater for Accrington Stanley. Training ground, the, the, the new dressing rooms, the boardroom, everything off the pitch is, is moving forward. Um, I know they've, they've had they've got the other sending off really early on in the week, didn't they? Was it Portsmouth they played? Portsmouth? Uh, they did it play Portsmouth at home, did they, they during midweek? Yeah, they lost 3-1, yeah. And so they've, they've seen things that have gone against them as well. MK, MK sold £8 million, and they had on £8 million worth of players in the last transfer in the, in the summer window. And, and I meant to, I was saying before, well, well, I did over a period of time at Oxford, for them to do that in one window with Darling and Twine, who were just to name two of some of the players that they, got, they, they lost in the last window. That's that's unbelievable to compete the year after. I don't think they should be where they are. Like Oxford shouldn't be where they are. This weekend's big because I think um, Mo- uh, Oxford go to Morecambe and Atkinson Stanley play MK Dons. Uh, yeah, well, actually, let's give the fixtures. I've already said Friday night it's Sheffield Wednesday uh, at home to sixth place Bolton. Then on Saturday, early kickoff, Peterborough, six points off the playoffs, go to Lincoln. And then as Carl says... Accrington play MK Don, so that's 20th against 21st. Fifth place, Derby are at home to Fleetwood. Third place, Ipswich, who have won their last five, they're at home to Shrewsbury. Oxford, three points and two places above the relegation zone, go to Morecambe. It's second place, Plymouth at home to bottom club, Forest Green, who are now 12 points from safety. And then Wickham against Barnsley is seventh v fourth should point out as well tuesday night plymouth are at accrington and barnsley and sheffield wednesday play each other in a south yorkshire derby did you ask me a question there or are you expecting one from me no i, I, I asked about the fixtures and you just answered perfectly thank you thank you very much indeed any other comments to make about skybet league one or shall we move on to skybet league two carl yes mate Good. He's got one eye on his battery when he says that. And actually, just let me let me tell you, we'll do this in a, a slightly different way. In Skybet League 2, then, this coming weekend, early kickoff for sixth place, Bradford at home to Hartlepool United. The game of the day is third entertaining second. That is Carlisle United against 
Stevenage. Stevenage two points ahead of Carlisle. The leaders nine points clear of fourth uh, with a game in hand. Leighton Orient, they entertain Colchester. Fourth place, Northampton Town are at home to Crewe. Seventh place, Salford entertain Doncaster. And Stockport against Mansfield is fifth against eighth. Did you see, just talking of Skybet League 2, that strange old incident last weekend where the Bradford City goalkeeper, Harry Lewis, got his lines muddled up yeah. at Newport County. There was light markings left from a rugby match and he misinterpreted what was the edge of his box and the ref obviously let it, appreciated what had happened. And let him, You don't see that too often, do you? But is that a concern in football on those multi-use pitches? Well, the referee got it wrong. The referee got it wrong for me. I, the rules are the rules. Um, if I was manager of the team where the goalie made the mistake, I'll be coming to you after the game and saying, this is a disgrace and the manager got it right. One, the referee got it right. If it was on the reverse of that and that happened against me, I could argue, well, tell you what, I'll tell my goalie to start 10 yards outside his box and do exactly the same thing week in, week out. And I've got an argument with the PGMOL to say that, well, you've said that that's an error in judgments because of the line. So you're almost doing what he's done. It's almost could create a problem moving forward because what happened in a, it was such a surreal set of circumstances. You can see the, the goalkeeper didn't mean it. You can see that it, it was clearly obvious the shock on his face once he's handled the ball and the referee blew the whistle. But it, for me, the the lines on the pitch they, generally now, Clemens, you know, they get covered up with a different colour paint before you play. Um, or they try and go over it with some green paint just to sort of take it away a little bit. But for me, the referee got that wrong. That's interesting because I suppose if there's anything that could be described as a discretionary interpretation of the rules or not, then as you say, it can potentially open the, the floodgates. R I guess rules really yeah, you changed have... my view on that, actually. Yeah. We, have, we, ask, we, have, we do ask referees to, to use common sense. We get that. Yeah. And common sense has to prevail nine times out of ten. But this is actually with the laws of the game. And before the game, the referee knew that line was there. The players knew that line was there. So that 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 is a conversation for me that if you were... I would have been a conversation, I'm sure, that the PGMOL, uh, Jones, you certainly would have had with his, with, his, with his staff. Because... I don't think that's common sense. I think the common sense should have prevailed at the beginning of it. And you go, well, hang on, they play on this pitch every single week, North uh, Newport, but on for, for Bradford that don't. But that does mean now what happens in future games when that does happen? Because you will get then managers and people asking, can that red car be rescinded? Because we have proof and evidence that this has been used before where we've, we've let the goalkeeper off and the referee uses is his interpretation of the rules to say that he was just unlucky or he made a misjudgment because of a line that he thought was his penalty area. Mm. I, listen, I hope all of you listening or watching us uh, in the pictures version on YouTube appreciate that we're getting the innermost workings of a manager's, of a manager's mind with regard to these oh, different I situations. Would want to, quite wait, if, I was, if I was Mark Hughes, I would have actually saying to the referee, I'd be writing to the fourth official and I'd be saying, to, and I would be saying to him, if you've made this decision, you've got this wrong. You didn't say before. So I, I have to see this both, you have to see this both sides as well. We're there to win. And yeah. I think if you were on the reverse of that, you would be arguing tooth and nail to say that that, that should not be a sending off. But, I think for me, that certainly was sending off. So many great managers, managerial types, uh, characters, personalities at the top of Skybet League Two. You know, um, love him or hate him, Steve Evans, who's been on a couple of times this season, is one. Paul Simpson, phenomenal turnaround of. Carlisle, John Brady, the Aussie at Northampton, still very much in the mix there. I, I can't help but look at Leighton Orient, though, and have to ask you just how hard it is when you have been on top the entire season to just keep going like Richie Wellens has, Carl. He's getting no compliments whatsoever, right, for this. But let me say, it's a lot easier being at the top to stay at the top than be at the bottom to try and get okay. away from it. <laughs> I'm not, right. I'm Richie, I know Richie really well and he's done an unbelievable job and he really has and, and we played them in the cup what was it this year 
shows how long it was in the uh, Papa John's Cup. And I think we won, we won four or five. He made a lot of changes, but he made a lot of changes. Um, and it, you, you could sense, I was speaking to them afterwards, and they'd just come off the back of these really good results. They had this self-belief amongst them. And again, some of the signings he's made have been absolutely brilliant. And again, that's another ground. I remember going there many, many times with Russell Slade being there and how difficult it was. And Mooney up front and people like him playing. And co- they, they were just a really good team. And they were a real difficult team to play against. And it, it seems once you get that place going, it's a difficult place to go anyway, like I said to you before, which a lot of grounds in the NFL are very similar. But yeah, I'm sure he'll, uh, he wouldn't want to swap with anybody else trying to stay there, mate. Trust me. Yeah. Uh, on the subject of which, and I feel like we've had references to many different Merseyside managers over the course of the time we've just spent together. Uh, Jim Bentley fighting away at the bottom of the entire yeah. EFL with with Rochdale. Is Jim somebody that you you know? I, I assume all you scouts managers just live in a little shoebox and go out to work every morning. Somebody takes it in turns to make the sandwiches and somebody else does the washing and changes the beds and stuff like that. Do you know Jim well? Yeah. Very, very, very well. You did? We're from the same okay. area. Same same. Ah. Yeah, so I've known I've known Jim for nearly all, all my, since about 11, 12 years of age, I've known of Jim. So <clears throat> he's someone that, I, yeah, and uh in Chadwick's there as assistant manager. He used to play for Everton and stuff. And I know he played with my brother as well when he was at Everton, a young player. So I know the two of them really, really well. Uh, they used to train at Oxford all the time when they played down south. So we used to get to see him quite a lot. Someone who's had obviously with his health over a period of time when he was when he was a filed and and obviously he's he is a good, he's a manager that's gone in with a very difficult challenge. When he got in there, he knew it was going to be almost impossible, but he stuck to his guns. He took the opportunity. Um, and it's it's always it's rubbish when you see teams down there the likes of Rochdale, who you know uh, we speak before at the top of the EFL and how great it is. But they're the teams; they are the real, they are the heartbeat of our leagues. Um, as, as you well know, that you've been there many many times, and you've had some fantastic teams and made it difficult. You've always been around that league too, and, and obviously every now and then being in League One. But it's always been they're just a real traditional EFL team, and you, you don't want to see these teams lost. Out of the league, like just like Stockport did a long time ago, and now finding a way back. So it's I'm just a lover of the EFL, mate, and any team that comes out of it, I'm disappointed for. Yeah, but you're also an acknowledger of the rules that two teams have to be relegated out of the EFL at the end of every season, and at some point very soon, Rochdale are going to have to put a little run together because two league wins in their last 19 matches is not going to cut the mustard no. when you got a continuation of when you've already got a five point gap to make up on a position of safety. So Jim is going to have to pull a three wins out of four out of the bag. He needs to get himself out of this situation and quickly. I, I think almost or what what do not that it, not that the same it might sound a strange comment. What might help is. Almost, you've got nothing to lose now. You are playing with no pressure. You, you fundamentally, where you just said, then you're five points adrift of the team who were in 22nd. You were under no pressure because you're almost done. Okay, yeah, the criticism you're going to receive from the fans when you're playing at home, maybe. But other than that, now it is almost like you've got to play with no fear. And and the worst case scenario is where they're at. It can't get any worse. Oh, the inevitable may happen. But there'll be teams who are sat 22nd and maybe 20, 21st, just a little bit above that, be going, oh, we're in a position where we want to be. If they get a few results, are we the team under pressure? But like I said to you before, with Sheffield United and having to lose maybe this weekend or the following weekend, you just think to yourself, something's got to happen sooner rather than later to really make them, one, believe that they can do it, no pressure, and put a little bit of pressure on them teams who are 22nd and 21st. Yeah, I did this Saturday's fixtures. I should say there are uh, a handful as well midweek next week, and that does include Bradford City entertaining Carlisle United. Finally, um, do I need to worry about you, or are you going to be okay? Are you, what are you going to do for the rest of this season? I know your phone has rung a little bit mm. with potential opportunities, but you've decided to have a little bit of a rest period. But are yeah. you going to be all right? Yeah, I'm. I'm good, mate. Um... I didn't want to go in right away. There was one or two things that sort of got, I got little phone calls for, and I just didn't. I wasn't ready. I just felt the 
what I'd gone through in the last six months was was something that played on me a little bit, um, personally. And I wasn't the same person away from football that I was in football. Maybe the mask that I had um, covered it a little bit, but I wasn't comfortable with who I was and what what was going on. So I think... Take, please, will you please will you explain what you can, just, what you mean by that? Things like criticism and stuff that's been going on, that I just I found difficult to try and balance a number of things in my life. And I feel that I, to go back in now, I, I'd almost be... It'd be almost saying to myself, hang on, you've said these things now to, to come out, to relax and to, 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 to take stock, to go back in right away would have been a bit silly. <clears throat> this is now three weeks on. I've had, obviously, this week's one of my favourite weeks of the year anyway with, with Cheltenham. And I'm going to go and spend a bit of time up in Liverpool, do a bit of travelling, <clears throat> go and watch a few people work, which have had some wonderful invita- invitations to go in and see people, different academies at different levels some Premier League managers as well who've asked me to go and see them and, and do a bit of work and a bit of research, do a little bit of media because I still love football and I've obviously my knowledge of the game inside the game is 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 okay. So I can I can use that as an opportunity to sort of take a breath, take a step back, have a good summer um with my family and, and, and look to recharge and, and start watching football proper, properly with that objective to get back in. I, I I've never hid Clement, I do want to go abroad at some stage. I do want to learn a different culture and a different way of, of seeing things and doing things. But equally, as I keep saying to you many, many times through this little interview, that the EFL is, is still the most exciting leagues anywhere you're going to get. So you, you're sort of left with a little bit of a an open mindedness to what the next step your journey is going to look like. Well, listen, assuming you can find the mains cable for your laptop, you're welcome to come and join us on the official EFL podcast anytime because, mate, you have given us such brilliant brilliant insights throughout the last thank you 45 minutes ish we've spent together great to talk to you thanks for being with us Cheers, Rest off. thanks mate thank you wasn't that great a huge thank you to carl robinson if you've enjoyed listening then please do give us a five star rating press the subscribe button and share on your socials if you'd like to get in touch with your comments on anything that you've heard in this episode podcast at efl.com that's podcast at EFL.com. I'm Mark Clement. Join us again soon for another episode of The Official EFL Podcast.